Uh, this is the, uh, let me turn on the transcript for a second. <laughs> this is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, July 7th, 2022. Boris Johnson has said he'll step down. COVID is still rumbling in the background. Rights are under threat all over the place. Uh, and we were just talking about what does it mean when somebody asks you, how are you? <laughs> in a world like that. Yeah, yeah. In a world gone mad, how are you? So how is everybody? <laughs> Intentional irony. Um, today is a check-in format. So I'm just going to wander around and invite people uh, to share OGME things. I read Pete's Plex dispatch this morning, having struggled to maybe send him a paragraph, and he wrote like all kinds of cool stuff. So I'm hoping Pete shows up here so I can thank him uh, with everyone. But like, holy beans! Wow, um, that's quite remarkable. He's <clears throat> doing a great service. Yeah, yeah. Help us see ourselves. Yeah, he's awesome. <laughs> Um, so um, let, let's, let me go uh, Hank, Klaus, Scott, for starters. Unmute. Okay. Yeah, yeah so much better. Great. Uh, in uh, yesterday's meta call, which I think most of you were not on, I mentioned two things uh, which... Uh, are on my mind, and I'll mention them again briefly now. Uh, one of them is I've just completed a, uh, a set of uh, uh, six and a half hour online vision sessions for the nation of Wales. Uh, that is the nation that's part of uh, what used to be Boris Johnson's uh, uh, country and uh, possibly Boris's uh, uh, successor will be more uh, uh, congenial with it. Uh, we had uh, four different sessions of approximately 20 to 30 people each uh, using the positive cartography method to uh, uh, co-create uh, building blocks for a vision of how they would like to see the country in 15 years was uh, for Wales, I think, very uh, enlightening and uh, a successful uh, project. And for myself as a designer of the methodology and leader of a team that carried it out, uh, really very interesting. And I'm going to be spending, it just, just finished two days ago, and I'm going to be spending the next uh, couple of weeks trying to understand what I learned about uh, uh orchestrating and facilitating a six and a half hour online session that gives people more energy than they had when they brought came into it. That's point one. Second point uh, is a little more negative. Uh, they're increasing uh, news reports uh, online and, uh, and uh, uh, offline uh, media about the growing uh, despair in society and especially amongst the youth, uh, climate anxiety. Uh, and I'm already dialoguing with a number of people in different organizations about what can be done to counteract that or to address it. And I had really interesting responses from five different people in the uh, uh, six different people in the session of, of Met Project yesterday who said they'd like to talk about it. Uh, so I mention it here as well, since most of you weren't in that call. Uh, I think uh, it's a key challenge for the future if young people are totally in despair about doing something about uh, climate. And it's up to people like us to step up and 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 help them and help society. I mean, we are, we are the ancestors of our own future. So that's another thing that's really interesting. And as a one third thing, it's 
specifically for, for Jerry, but to some extent it's for all of us. Leif Edmondson, who has uh, a really enlightened uh, friend of ours from Sweden, who has taken part in a couple of these calls, wants to send his regards to Jerry and to this group, and would like in the future to see if it's possible to organize something internationally uh, about uh, societal information innovation uh, in, on a topic that interests us all, involving uh, uh, future centers in the Netherlands and in Sweden and, and perhaps other institutions around the world. So I just mentioned that on passant, uh, more of that to come in the future. Uh, thanks, Jerry, for letting me lead off. Um, Hank, that was awesome. And um, love that idea. Would lo love to know more and, and I think would be very happy. And a bunch of us would love to jump in on the Futures uh, Center's discussion. Um, I, I just had a question on the first item you had on positive cartography from all the sessions and all that. Um, what did anything stick in your mind from the people what, what, what participants did that that we were like, whoa, okay, how did they get there or or something that was memorable, just so that we can get more of a flavor of where positive cartography uh, yeah. heads and what it's like. Yeah. Okay. That that's a that's a that's a great question. Uh, most of the online sessions since the COVID lockdown uh, have been uh, talk, talk, talk. Uh, listen, be bored, fall asleep. Uh, it's all words and it's all cognitive. In positive cartography, we ask people to choose images, either images that they've sent in advance and we've uploaded on a Miro board or images we've seeded the Miro board with and say, hey, when I'm thinking of the future of uh, healthcare in the isolated valleys of Wales, this image is what I see. Uh, look at it, tell me, do you see the same thing or do you see something different? And that gave people lots of energy because suddenly they weren't listening to policy, to, to policy positions and techno babble, but they were listening to people talking about the things that they see in the future. And that's one part of the answer I wanna give. And the other part of the answer I wanted to give is in framing the sessions for the people, I asked them to participate both as a person who has a specific function in society, whether it's elected government, a civil servant, uh, a, a leader of an NGO or what else, but also as a citizen and a resident of Wales in the future. And we had a number of people who said, well, I think something about health is important and I'm in transportation, so I didn't know any of the details, but I've got four children and I'm a farmer's daughter. And looking at it from the point of view of a mother and someone living on a farm, this is what I can say. And that also was something that rarely goes on in those types of discussions. And I think both of them fed the, the group with so much energy. Mm, that sounds really valuable. Thank you. Thank you. You're reminding me of an exercise that John Keogh and his colleagues at the Idea Factory invented oh, yeah. back, back in Silicon Alley days called the Maastricht Cubes. Did you hear about this? Uh, sounds vaguely familiar, but I can't place it. So tell, they call them Maastricht on. Cubes because they invented this for a workshop held in Maastricht. So that, that's yeah. the only connection. Um, but what they did was they took a Jungian photo archive. So it's, it's basically a collection of several hundred uh, photos that that relate to different sort of emotions, archetypes, whatever. Uh, they cut them all into, let's say, four by four. They printed them onto four by four squares with Velcro. And then they gave everybody a cube that had Velcro, the other side of Velcro, basically on all six sides of the cube. And they asked people a question and everybody went up to the wall, which had repeats of all the images. So there were several versions of each image from the Jungian archive. And then everybody, and some sometimes they'd use this, I think, as, a, as an icebreaker. But you had to tell your life story from the Jungian archive and you go boop, 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 boop. And then everybody stands up and rotates the cube around and says, then this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. Uh, and it was it was pretty good and pretty powerful and, and relatively simple. So sounds really interesting. I'll, I'll have a look for it online. Uh, sounds like a terrific thing to do when you actually are face to face with people. Yeah, and exactly. Possibly, 
and possibly there's a there's a good uh, a virtual uh, translation. Too. It could it could easily show up yeah. as a virtual uh, palette of images that 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 fit for you or something like that. That would yeah. be pretty simple to do. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, Hank. Anyone else with thoughts or Hank's uh, thoughts or Hank's yes. for Hank? Yes. Um, Hank, if you're going to do something like this again, let's talk. Um, I did a program in Portugal a few years ago for the Society for Organizational Learning, and we had about 50 people in um, Braga. And so one of the exercises that we cooked up was um, what we called the, the tree of um, generations. And so we asked people um, in small groups um, to share with uh, their fellows things that they had um, learned from their grandparents that were really important to them. Um, you know, life lessons from grandparents or grandparents' generation, if you didn't happen to have grandparents, and to write them down, you know, short words and phrases on, on post-its, separate post-its. And then we asked them to um, think about uh, things that they want for their grandchildren, um, you know, the, the, the kind of world that they are looking to instill and, and create for their grandchildren. Again, write them on post-its. And then the last uh, exercise was to... Um, write down things that you are doing that carry forward the lessons from your grandparents to make that world for your grandchildren. And then we had this huge tree uh, that we had, we had put, you know, we'd drawn on, on the wall on, on some mural paper. And we said, come up here and put the um, grandparents in the roots and put the grandchildren in the branches and put the stuff you're doing as the trunk. So you're the connection between the two. And it was fantastic. People just like, they were, bonkers over this oh my god look at what we've gotten here this is such an amazing example of collective intelligence you know and i think this would yeah. easily adapt to a mural board you could you could totally do this online yeah. it would it yeah. would completely work so um that's the kind of stuff i like to cook up and and play yeah with. great beautiful. fantastic and i'll be in touch because i am hoping to do this type of thing once again after the summer fantastic yeah thank you anyone else that was great. Thank you. Um, let's go Klaus, Scott, Doug Carmichael. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Pete rescued me in some ways um, because I, I had a moment of panic come over me last week. You know, I developed this, this webinar uh, with the Sarah Club and it's the national uh, team, the national grassroots network. And I've been working with this group for like, three, four years, four, probably more. Uh, it took me a really long time you know, to, to come in as a corporate guy and, and get their, con their, their trust and confidence and so on. So now we have a team together that's really on fire, but they are they're all brand new to this. And so we don't, we don't have resources lined up. We don't have the right support staff. So we got this webinar lined up and the interesting part of it is I've been looking for a lever, you know, that you can pull, a big lever you can pull. Because the food system is so complex. It has so many moving parts, right? And even within the Sierra Club, you have the pollinator team, the sewage sludge team, the, uh, the anti kfo team, you know, so you have like a dozen teams that are working on components. It's like the proverbial elephant and blind people walking around it, you know, all seeing. So the, the, the intention was to bring in systems thinking. You know? And, and I've, you know, I've done this with Gene Bellinger, this, this work we remember for six months, we worked on developing this, this thing. And Gene was saying, you know what? This thing is useless because you, it's way, way beyond ex, ex, explainable. It's too complex. Uh, so you have to find a way to, 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 you have to find one message that cuts through everything. And I finally found it and it's called water. Because everybody understands water. It's either too much of it or not enough of it, or it's polluted or it's poisoned. But the, the research shows that over 90% of the American public has a relationship with water uh, and, and, and is concerned about, about uh, water. And... <clears throat> But having listened in on the congressional hearings from the agriculture department, the, the, the Republican Party has already lined up solid, solid opposition against anything climate change related. I mean, the, the co-leader, the, the, the leading member uh, in the House and the Senate both made comments saying 
uh, there will be no regulation, no initiative uh, that is focused that, that is focused on climate change. We are not going to deal and change our uh, agricultural system because of climate change. So water, and this is getting pretty technical here, but in order to fix water tables and to clean up water and to protect aquifers and so on, you have to do the exact same things to regenerate your soil back to health as you do when you talk about climate change. Because you have to move carbon into the soil because carbon is the feedstock for the soil microbiome. And the soil microbiome is the root of life. Yeah? Because the, the, the bacteria and, 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 and uh, microorganisms in the soil form the basics of life from which life then evolves into higher forms. Right? So out of there come worms. Then birds eat worms, and you know, so so you have that that whole chain of life building up from within the soil microbiome. And water is is when, when you when you look around the country, uh, think about the damage uh, around the Gulf of Mexico, you know, along the coastlines of Florida, where you have dead zones and you know, thousands of dead fish on the beach. You, you have the same in Lake Erie, where the, uh, an entire city had to shut down their water filtration systems because they got all this sludge coming in uh, for, from algal pollution and so on. People don't link that the, the, the stuff coming down the Mississippi River Delta, which is the runoff from farms, is causing this. And in virtually every community in America, there is some issue related to water. You know, either you have a pollution in your lake and you have all this algae growing there you know, or like in like in California the farmers are sucking the aquifers dry and and uh, pulling them so low that an entire city loses its water supply so there are issues related to water um, so when so I found now the, the Sierra Club is this huge I mean it's a four and a half million member organization you know, very big bureaucracy. I mean, they have a significant multi-million dollar budget and so on, but it's it's quite quite rigid uh, in in what they do. So I'm I'm I found uh, uh, a state chapter, you know, Illinois in this case, where uh, you know they're saying let's go for it, let's do this, and they connected me locally to a farmer who is a Sierra Club member, a commodity grower. And to uh, the uh, leader of the local soil and water conservation district, and that lady got so excited about the idea, you know, of being able to communicate out the importance of focusing on water and repairing watersheds, that she recruited the director of the Illinois Soil and Water Conservation Districts, the association, plus two senior level members from USDA who focused on the conservation component. And so now we have an amazing panel. We have two farmers, two activist farmers, commodity growers. And, we, and let me, let me uh, here's the latest uh, creative that we have um, developed. It's still, it's still in, in, uh, in uh, the rough format, but I finally I said, oh, I had a designer and I'm just paying for it. But, uh, um, we, we now have an opportunity to, to get into the farm bill. The farm bill spends hundreds of billions of dollars every year to influence the way that we farm, right? So, so the, the, the subsidies that are going into, into the farm sector are distorting the entire, the entire uh, industry. You know, the, the, the money goes into the support of commodity crops. And commodity crops are, are raised as monocrops. And when you, when you put the same crop into the ground over and over, the soil dies because uh, it takes different, the, the crop, each crop takes different nutrients out of the soil. And if you put the same soil, the same crop in over and over, then these, the, the soil by microbiome dies. Then you have to put in chemical fertilizers, you know, and, and, uh, like like synthetic nitrogen, uh, phosphates, and so on, you know, made uh, with fossil fuels, and then you have to protect these crops because now the the natural defenses in the soil have gone. 
So now you need uh, glyphosate, you know, and ever more toxic chemicals to defend against predation from insects and weeds. And then, and, and this is an arms race, which we're losing, obviously, because nature is, is building up defenses against these poisons. And so now we're dealing with neonoids and, and, and crazy stuff. And, and so the industry refuses to budge. You know, the, the, I mean, for, for example, right now, synthetic nitrogen is getting to be really expensive. It's made from natural gas or with natural gas. So they're using sewage sludge which is the, the, the sewage from cities, right? Well, that stuff is full of toxins. You know, the, and, and some of them are what they call forever chemicals you know, that are going into, that they're now using for fertilizer, which then transfers into the crops, which then transfers into you know, our, our, uh, 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 our system and which we absorb. You know? And so the, the idea here is that they are, they are, uh, when you look at the farm bill, it, I mean, it's like explaining the defense bill, it's crazy, you know, but there are basically three sections in the farm bill. One is uh, the, the commodity, the crop subsidies, where they're paying uh, to farmers to go specific crops and guarantee the price and you know, subsidize it. Then you have uh, nutritional assistance programs, 76% of the farm bill is nutritional assistance programs. So they spend about $200 billion a year on SNAP benefits and school meals and that sort of thing. You know, and then the other then there is one component that's called the conservation programs. And those conservation programs are now dealing specifically with issues like pollinator protection, biodiversity, soil health, and so on and so on. But individually, these programs are not effective. You need to accumulate, you need to aggregate these programs so that the farmer can shift you know, and, and repair his soil and structure his soil, which then at the same time disrupts the entire industry. Because when you, when you, are, when you are prioritizing soil health, that means you have to change the types of crops you're growing. Now you, you, because each crop, I mean, you can't grow the same crop in Florida as you do in California or in, in Oregon if you, want to, if you want to repair your soil and you don't treat soil is a space as a base sand line. Yeah. And so the industry would have enormous costs to change their supply chain strategies and, and accommodate farmers uh, when, they, when they need to shift. The European Union, for example, mandates three crops in rotation uh, so that, it, so that uh, the soil has time to recover between crop cycles and so on. So anyway, um, in this webinar, we want to have farmers explain, here's what I need to do to repair a watershed. If I was taking a dead piece of land where the soil is dead and I want to revive it, here's what I need to do. And then we have the government officials saying, okay, for this purpose, you can use this program and you add that program and, 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 and pull those things together and develop a three to five year plan. And so that's what we want to put on the table because all our volunteers, you know, we, we, are, we are talking about farm bill, but we, we, we don't have the specificity that you need you know, to, to know these five or six programs because then we can go and lobby Congress and, and, and ask for funding because these things are notoriously underfunded. And you know, when the Trump administration came in, the first thing they did was defund the commodity the conservation programs. So anyway, that's sort of where I'm at. And, and I've, I haven't had time. Typically, I give myself three months to set up a webinar like this, and I've had only two months for whatever reason. And, and so I don't have enough time to really focus on the communications aspect of this webinar. Um, the last one I did with business climate leaders, we had over 1,500 registrations. So we released the first batch here and ended up with 24 reservations. So that's why I panicked, <laughs> you know, to get, my God, what am I going to do here? And, but but the, the, the message needs to translate into different audiences differently. You know? So, so there, there has to be, because everybody, I mean, a, a, the housewife in, or, or school kids you know, in, in, in the cities, they have no idea what you're talking about when you talk about soil health, right? And, and uh, um, for a farmer, it's a different conversation and so on and so on. So we are, uh, we are trying to create a core message like 
similar to what I just posted here. And then we need help to communicate that with, with an explanation attached, right? So um, if you look at your audience, the people that you are talking uh, with most of the time, you know, how would they get this? Uh, uh, how, how can this become understandable to a broader audience? So anyway, um, I think we're on a really good track. You know, I've been on the advisory uh, board for the American Sustainable Business Network and for Kiss the Crown and, and uh, Citizen Climate Lobby and all the Sierra Club. So the, it's getting around, right? The strategy is taking hold. And, uh, and Farm Bill has become a center focus for you know, a host of NGOs who, who, are, who are going to uh, uh, exert an impact there. Thank you, that was a long story. That was a brainful, thanks Klaus. Um, and so many interesting things. I, I'm happy, I mean, the way you started the, uh, finding the lever of just focusing on water is really interesting because so many of the levers or so many of the useful <clears throat> things that have to happen are poisoned or stalled or uh, don't really, you know, don't get enough traction or whatever else. It's kind of crazy. Um, anyone else with, uh, with thoughts, suggestions? Um, yeah, actually, cool. I do. go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, um, I did want to add not so much towards the webinar, but to the bigger picture. I wanted to say that um, whoever's working on communications regarding the bill, in my opinion, there's a whole nother message strictly geared towards the people that are for regulations, like the lib I mean, for getting rid of regulations. There's a message, I think, for libertarians. And if you know who's working on that message, I would love to help because I do think I have some insight. So I just wanted to say that. So, so there isn't enough time you know, to really dig into this, but Stacey, if you, uh, if you take this core message here and then expand to, to this audience, right? This with an with a introduction. Not, let me be clear. I don't have a libertarian audience. I'm saying that I think I have insight into how to take not about your webinar, but how to take the message to a libertarian audience, which I could find because that's what I use Facebook for. You know, I'm able to track people and find the groups. I'm saying I could help in shaping that message to put the pressure on, you know, the people in Congress that are saying, you know, we're fighting for you because we're not going to let them regulate us. And how I, I think I could help to switch that for them to see it a little bit differently because they're already locked mm -hmm. into feeling they're being manipulated. So it's kind of easy to show them they're being manipulated a different way. Yeah. And I, I saw an article a couple of days ago that was about a Democratic representative who was doing well running on sort of deregulation, strategic deregulation uh, in his district, uh, which was a relatively conservative district. But it was a message that is not expected from a Democrat. And I don't remember any of the dynamics, but sort of along these lines. Hmm. Uh, Gil, you're muted. Sometimes more eloquent when I'm muted. Uh -huh. um, uh, the libertarian angle, I think, is really important because I imagine that a lot of farmers identify as libertarians in some way, and so crafting that message would be really key. Klaus, I'm I'm um, always uh, I, I'm really glad that you're doing what you're doing, uh, and I appreciate your depth of knowledge and your systems perspective on the ag world. I have a background in sustainable ag in one of my past lives, so I'm very oriented to this. Um, I love what you got, uh, and I'm concerned. Uh, you said I don't have time to focus on the communications aspect. Uh, and I think the communications aspect is really key. Uh, you are a wealth of information and facts and data and perspective. Uh, but e for me, even as somebody who knows this field, I find it kind of overwhelming to listen to you. And I wonder how it is for people who are being introduced to the topic for the first time. So I would really encourage you um, to focus a lot more on the communications aspect, on who you're trying to reach, what they care about, how they're listening, and what are the ways to, to distill and parse and kind of drip out the information in a way that they can receive? Because uh, in my experience, facts don't change people uh, and piles of facts don't change people. Uh, and I, I think what you're about is how to get people engaged in effective action around these issues. I mean, farm bill is like, like you say, monstrous complex. Nobody's gonna take on the farm bill. They're gonna take on the piece that matters to them 
and then maybe move further and further into the game. So um, um, I don't have more specific than that. Now there are people who are brilliant at this kind of work who could who could work with you on it. Uh, I just really want I want to see what you're doing have traction and have impact. Yeah. And um, I'm I'm just concerned that you know I know this is an inside group. This is not necessarily how you would do webinar or presentation. Um, but uh, for me, the you know the the key was when you said I don't have time to focus on the communications aspect. I think, man, that's that's exactly where there's work needed. Well, and I meant to say I didn't have time because I was so focused on the, doing the technical aspect. Yeah. This business climate leaders, uh, I had a dedicated, first of all, I had Joel with me, who was the is a retired CEO from a, from a uh, billion dollar biofuel company, and it's just a powerhouse. And then I had a dedicated graphics uh, communications uh, uh, specialist with, with me. And, and a $10,000 budget that BCL gave us to pay for this. You know? So I didn't have to focus on communications as much. So when I got ready to launch this thing, I realized, holy smokes, you know, no one here on the team <laughs> knows how to do this. And so I have to get into it. But uh, this is not my skill set. No, this is not my, my sandbox. So this is where uh, uh, last week when I sent a note to Jerry and Peter and everything. And so that was my moment of panic, but I totally agree with what you're saying. Uh, and and uh, uh, as I'm developing I think, I think, this I think team. It, yeah, I, th I think it could be your sandbox. I think there's some, you know, there's, there, there's maybe like a workout routine for you to do or a coach to have around that to really strengthen that aspect of your, of your toolbox. Because uh, yeah. what you've got is so rich and so valuable, but kind of overwhelming. Yeah. And, and the, the, the message around water resonates, you know, across many yep. sections, yep. but it needs to be, it needs to be uh, again, customized because when you talk to somebody in Florida, yep. you know, they have a different relationship with water than somebody in California yep. who's mm -hmm. running dry. So, so it, the message needs to be uh, a customer. And then in other sections of the country, the water is so polluted you can't drink it, right? Because it has all these agricultural chemicals in it. Yep. So, so there is there is a a, a a meta message, you know, that cuts through the entire farm bill, really. Um, but then you need to explain it uh, to people in ways that it it works within their context, you not know, within their understanding. Yep. yep. Um, Mr. Breitbart. Oh, sorry. Again. Just, I'm sorry, very quickly, Jerry, one other thing, class on water, have you, uh, I, I forget if we've talked about this before, but are you following the work of Walter Yenny out of Australia on the relationship of water and soil and climate? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Mr. Breitbart. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, okay. I, ju just on Gil's point, sort of elevated. In principle, it's not on you to figure out the media communications. That's not your jam. Like the, the way I'm, the, the way that hit. The truth of the matter is that what we're living in is is about media communications. The whole swing to the right, the whole devaluation of facts, the whole confusion distortion field that's happened has been a 100% a, a function of a, of a PR media, very <laughs> intentional, very deliberate, relentless campaign targeted at. And what came up for me as, as you were talking was, has anybody sort of galvanized and called out the folks that are in that media space, you know, that are at the top of that pyramid about, you know, where are you and, and what are you doing and why are you doing, what are you doing from the standpoint of galvanizing aligned people in the belly of that beast to step up and step in um, and, and, not just in connection with Klaus with your world, but you know, there, there are what a half a dozen scale are 3,000 pound gorillas, you're one of, all of which 
have the facts and the grounds and the basis for what the what the cure and what the what the answers are, but don't have the messaging capacity, resources, campaigns, coordination to impact on the end users that are being poisoned, the end users that are running dry, the end users that are, you know, dealing with all this. And, and the media piece is almost a standalone from, it has nothing to do with all the cause and effect that you're working on. It has everything to do with when that John or that Jane Q public goes to turn on the tap and, and gets nothing or gets something they can't use. And, and the sad part here is that um, if I was working on the industry behalf, I would be making a big six figure income. Um, and and I'm, we are competing against uh, the six figure folks who work in teams. Know, to screw up the works and to stem against that you know, is, is without resources and, and with an all volunteer team, that, that's a pretty heavy lift. You know? mm -hmm. Hank? Uh, yeah, I just want to add whether it's relevant or not it remains to be seen. For the last 25 years, I've been working uh, directly or indirectly with the Dutch Ministry of uh, Transportation and Water Management, uh, which is runs one of the future centers I referred to earlier on in this call. And they know a lot about what people think about water issues, how to get people's attention from other aspects of uh, Calamity, calamities coming our way onto what, which don't seem personal enough to water, which seems personal to everyone. Uh, so in the future, if it turns out to be relevant, perhaps I can make connections uh, with people there who might be able to, to shed light on European aspects of how to deal with this. Yeah, thank you. And and Hank, uh, from conversations with you and so and, and Leif and so forth, I'm just showing here the connections yeah. into the ministries and, and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. That was cool. And there's long and the history of, of the, the low countries and water is absolutely <laughs> riveting, completely fascinating, and will become more and more necessary for human survival. Absolutely. There we go. Yeah. So let's go. Uh, Scott, Doug Carmichael, Stacy. Hey everybody. Mr. Mooring, good to see you. Good to be seen. Um, I noticed at the bottom of the graphic that Ken had provided that this is from data from 29 years ago from a book. And I think that kind of is a thread that relates to everyone talking about how to communicate this. That's 29 years ago. And the, the name of the book is Water in Crisis, A Guide to the World's Freshwater Resources from Oxford University. So I'm not sure that we don't know about this. I just wonder if, you know, again, the, the graphic shows the entire globe and that's really, really big. <laughs> it's, it's a really big, like, what do I do this afternoon that's going to help make this better? You know, I, I I don't have any idea. So anyway, my 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 thought on that, and that's just kind of a tail end off of off of Klaus's enormous challenge is he has the information, and it's been you know he's the next in the line to to continue to say, hey, here's what's going on, and you know who knows how long something like that takes. Um, all right, so uh, a simple update from me. Um, you may know, I've been talking about this for a while, that I've been working on a little framework of my own. It's just a personal framework that helped me tie together um, things I've been interested in for no reason other than I've been interested in them for the last 25 years. Um, thinking, perception, memory, creativity, games, stories, 
how to how to kind of have a life. And I've been working on this for the last couple of years. And I was able to actually surprisingly thread it all together in a stacked seven level, seven level framework. And it's been really helpful for me. Um, but the the message that I have for you today is pretty straightforward. Keep the same thing, but change the presentation format. And then whatever the thing is, is whatever you happen to be working on. So this is what it looked like. This was my first, wow, hey, it all fits. It's a bunch of scribbles, right? Makes sense to me. I have a couple of those. Yeah. So then that became a spreadsheet. A little more organized, a little clearer for me. Okay, great. It's a gridded format. Then I sat down one afternoon and made a card deck. And just for all... everybody, for everybody watching, if you pin uh, Scott's window, you can see him big on the screen. Yeah. Or if and, you go to speak not, with it's the main point is that you can see just generally yeah. what I'm doing. So the little card deck is literally just little cards that I cut out with scissors sitting at a picnic table, right? And each one was a thing. And obviously, you know, everything on that little handwritten thing was a thing. And then everything on the spreadsheet was the same thing, maybe updated a little bit. Then everything on the card deck was the same things, updated a little bit. And it kind of felt like it was great. It was interesting for me. And then I made it into an outline. So your classic, you know, outline, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it just like, it's not even two levels deep. It's just one level deep. And I looked at it and I said, oh, this is the table of contents for the book. And it wasn't until I put it in the exact same information that I put it in this format that all of a sudden it became serious because it's a, it's a card deck and that makes it fun and light and interesting and it's a spreadsheet. Well, that's helping me kind of sort it all out. And then it turns into this outline and I looked at it and I thought, oh, this is a, this is a book. That's, that's what this is. And, it, and this is how I can communicate this or whatever happens. But I think that the main point of it is it, it, it changed. Every time I took the information and, and made it into a different thing, instead of looking for new information, I just reorganized it, reformatted it. You know, it has a serious typeface in this case. On the card deck, it's handwritten, cut out with scissors on a picnic table, and that felt different. And so what I guess I would offer up is don't discard the tried and true classic formats that we've had for as long as we've had formats. It's an outline. I mean, if you're in elementary school, you probably learned outlines. Um, and we seem to want to find the latest, newest way of presenting something. And this one I handed to my wife and she said, oh, Okay, so when are you gonna when are you gonna publish this? All the rest of it was, you know, okay. Here's Scott doing his thing again. It's not for me. It's not interesting. I don't really understand what it is. She sees the outline. Boom. This is a thing I understand. And so, I guess that's my uh, that's my hope for today is to contribute that little bit. Um, Scott, thank you. I, well, thank you for walking us through your journey and having the different stages of it. That's super cool. <clears throat> and then you had made a comment in the chat that I wanted to ask you about that I think comes back to what you just did and said, which was when you watched Kiss the Ground, you were like, great, we've solved it, et cetera. And, and so I want to connect that with something I'm calling, I'm finding, trying to find a better name for this. I'm calling it instrumentation or instrumenting good ideas. 
And uh, the example I use is uh, the one, two, four, all pattern from the liberating structures pattern language about group facilitation. And my, my, my quest, my claim, and I'm hoping to be able to fund a little bit of software to do this, is that some wisdom buried on a book page or a website or a wiki someplace that it doesn't get found and doesn't get used could be turned into some code that is in a marketplace for Zoom applets that people could plug in that could then not only inform people about this pattern, which is really cool, one, two, four, all, but in fact, do the choreography for, for you. So for example, if there was a Zoom bot that was a group process facilitation expert bot, it could notice uh, something and then, and then recommend, hey, there's two or three group processes that could come in handy right now. Uh, and then one of the choices would be one, two, four, all. And if you press that button, it would then break, uh, define breakout rooms, assign people to breakout rooms, name the breakout rooms, do timing, uh, put prompts on the screen, et cetera, et cetera, to run you through one, two, four, all, which is not hard technically to do at all, but the knowledge of its existence is scant. And um, the work to actually make it happen is non-trivial. If you're busy hosting a, a Zoom session and anybody who's tried to you know, manage breakouts well and do all of that, knows that that's a bunch of work. So, sorry, long story, but but I'm trying to come back to, there's a lot of great information that's buried in documentary films like Kiss the Ground and uh, other sorts of things that isn't actually usable or useful, or never mind known. There's one stage, which is how do we make it more visible? There's another stage, which is how do we instrument it? Again, I don't know what the right word is here. Actionalize it, potentiate it. Ah. I want a clean, simple word like water. How do we water it? Um, how do we sprout it? I don't know. So that it then becomes a, a completely usable thing. And then your thought in the chat may not have been going in that direction at all, but you were like, I thought we'd solve this. So why isn't it sort of in motion? I'm like, partly we need to make things so that they're movable, so that they're actually easy to easy to tip into motion. Well, I can I can clarify a little bit, I think. Because that, that is interesting. So as you were talking, what I realized is that I can't solve all the problems. None of us can. And so we, we can either sit and be anxious about all the problems that we aren't solving personally, or we can pick and choose and reduce anxiety realistically by saying someone else is working on this. And I'm okay because someone else is working on this. Because we have problems that we all think, I don't have any idea what we're going to do about this. This is crazy. And seeing something like kiss the ground and think, oh, getting the carbon back into the soil. Oh, it's brilliant. OK, I get it. And then for me, at my engagement level, I'm good with that. Like, OK. That seems like a plan. That's going to take a while. That's going to take people other than me to solve because soil is not, even though I live on this planet and you know, water is, is critical to my life and soil is critical to my life. That's I'm one of eight billion, and that's not my problem to solve. I have my problem that I'm working on. And I think that there's multiple levels of engagement, perhaps, that okay, well, what's Maybe there's one thing that I can do that will help with that. Maybe I want to devote my life to this. Well, those those are levels. And I don't think that it's reasonable to expect everyone to say, I want to devote my life to this, even though the entire planet's health depends on it. But for me, a lot of that anxiety that I believe, uh, I can't remember who mentioned that at the beginning of the young people, well, maybe we can help just in one way by saying, hey, you know what? We figured out this really good idea. We haven't done it yet, but we have a, we have a plan. We have a direction. It's not simply we have no idea what to do. So that's, that's kind of where that thinking was came, coming from and that I'm not, <coughs> I'm willingly saying that's not my thing to solve. That's not my thing I can help promote in whatever way, but, but I'm, uh, I feel better knowing that things like that exist. Mm -hmm. Before I didn't, I thought, well, what are we going to do? So. Love that, Scott. Thank you. Gil? 
Scott, I like how you've uh, put that all together. Um, and it, it strikes me that, um, yeah, you're not gonna take that on. I'm not gonna go start a farm. Um, but when I go to the store, I can look at a label and buy this carton of milk rather than that carton of milk. Easy. I can mention to my friend that I did that, or when I have somebody over for dinner, I can say something about it. A buddy of mine used to, when he go, when he would go into a restaurant back in the days when he went into restaurants, um, he, he'd want to order a steak and he'd ask the waiter, "Where's this from?" And the waiter would say, "I got no idea." And he said, "Could I talk to the chef?" And the chef would come out and he'd ask and kind of discuss the provenance of the meat. And the waiter would listen, and the diners at the next couple of tables around them would listen. It'd be a very low-key conversation that started to expose people to thinking about where's your meat come from, where your vegetables come from. So, you know, I, I like what you say. There's many different levels of engagement. Um, and I think that's one of the things people are really hungry for. The system story is is big and overwhelming, and most people don't hear it the way we do. You know, like half of Americans read at eighth grade level or below. You know, all the stuff that we all here talk about and look at and read, 2% of the population either reads or even can read. And so, you know, making stuff accessible to people, both in terms of what they understand and also what they can do is really key. And I like what you said, you know, the comfort of knowing somebody's working on the big side of this that I can't take on, here's a piece I can do something about, it's great. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott and Julian? Really, really small addition to, to what Gil had said, I found out last year, two years ago, I think it was, that there are, there's a five levels of literacy in this generalized test. And the test was um, based on going to a website, finding a book that you searched for on the second page of the search results that did not have a name, a word in the title that was that was directly related to the topic. So the, the title was soil and you were searching for ground or something like that. That was the highest level, was to be able to, to go search for something, get to read all those, get to the second page and, and find the one that actually was, was relevant. And what I noticed that just blew me away was that they combined last time levels four and five because there weren't enough people in fifth. And so it, it made me realize once again that being in a group like this is a bubble of, of it is, well, it's an invisible bubble that we often don't think about. Well, of course everyone understands this and actually, and this is not elitist in, in any stretch. It's just, you know, some people are tall, some people are short, some people are, you know, it's like, this is just reality, it's distributed. And there's this little group that can understand a lot of this. And th the sad part is that, that we think that we, because that's what we talk about, is, you know, that, that translates. But anyway, um, yeah, so I, I will find that study and I'll post that later in this call. Thanks, Scott. Um, Julian? Yeah, Gil, I really liked what you were saying a few seconds ago. Because, um, and especially bring up the point about reading at eighth grade level or before, and I would encourage just thinking outside of this box of text and sound being the only ways to perceive and communicate, because people pick up on stuff using all of their senses, not just those. And a lot of times text isn't a great way to communicate something anyway. That's why we have pictures. Um, and I wanted to bring up again that old quote attributed to Confucius about, if I hear, I forget. If I see, I remember. If I do, I understand. And if we're going after understanding, we've got to find ways of better ways of communicating to people than just saying, here, go read this book or this web page. Thanks, Julian. <clears throat> uh, let's go, Doug Carmichael, Stacy Ken. Well, I'm not sure whether what I'm about to say is controversial or not. I just don't know this group well enough for maybe my own mind. But what I want to say is, I think we have made a fetish object out of democracy. Uh, we treat democracy as the solution to all our problems. Uh, the Greek historian Polybius helps us out by saying, look, if you have an internal issue, democracy is a great way to resolve it. 
But if the threat is from outside the state, uh, democracy is not good because you still get factions that compete with each other and prevent a coherent strategy. So the choice between uh, an autoc autocratic and a democratic approach is tactical and based on circumstances. <clears throat> I think it's important because I think that the world we're living, moving into, uh, let's see now, what are my notes here? <laughs> oh, those are Jerry's notes, not mine. Sorry, sorry, this is me just uh, sharing Polybius what little I know yeah, about that's him. Great. <clears throat> uh, so uh, I think we are moving into an era of global problems without global management. And global management is not likely to be democratic. It's going to be somewhat authoritarian, autocratic, whatever you want to call it. And there are times, Polybius makes clear, when that's a good way to go. Uh, and actually, Roman history picked up on Polybius and ran with that method for about 200 years, trying to shift uh, principle between tyranny and uh, democracy. And... Uh, I think we need to expand our own uh, sense of how to manage the problems and not make democracy the solution to every problem. Um, and I will add to what you just said that we're not even agreed about what democracy means. So is it representative democracy? Well, you know, one, does one person one vote actually work? Is it direct democracy? And nobody seems to think direct democracy actually works, which is the simplest form you would think people were talking about when they say democracy. So it's complicated. Klaus. Yeah, I mean, I question that that uh, there, is, there is such a thing as central leadership. When you look around the world, anywhere, any society that is led by a powerful individual basically dissolves into a mess uh, because the decision-making process is uninformed. So the, the, the power of democracy is to have information rise to the top, the information gets disseminated, challenged, you know, which is, an, which is uh, a process that's uh, frustrating, time consuming, inefficient. But on the other hand, the alternative is for an authoritarian leader to make a decision based on uh, incomplete information and to balance this, right? To, to balance, to have, um, a, a, an authoritarian bent leadership, you know, that, that uh, is able to, to put away with nonsense and, and really focus on solutions, but at the same time do it in, 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 a, in a fashion that is organized and, and structured and brings best available information to the top. I think that's the challenge we haven't solved yet. Thanks, Klaus. Gil? Yeah, um, Ross Ashby's Law of Requisite Variety argues against authoritarian for the reasons that uh, Klaus just said. Doug, the question I have for you, I mean, you know, I, I was really, one of the things that really struck me in the dawn of everything uh, was the assertion that there were cultures that would oscillate between authoritarian and what we would now call democratic or participatory cultures based on the season of the year and the and the external requirements, what it took to deal with it. It's kind of an echo of Poly Polybius's argument that with external threat, you need a more concentrated and, you know, and, and faster reflex kind of leadership. Uh, but if you, you know, if, if, if you're envisioning that global authoritarian leadership is one of the necessary solutions to the climate crisis, which it may well be. I don't, I'm not disputing that. Who's that leader? How are they chosen by whom for the sake of what? And that I think is a big impossible mess. It's much more likely that that authoritarian leadership is very <clears throat> to the things that we're concerned about here than for them. I wonder, I, I don't know how much you've thought about that, but I wonder where you go with that question. Well, I take some some uh, weak examples, but they're still examples like Churchill, Roosevelt, mm -hmm. uh, leaders that emerge that whose authority expands is more extensive than given to them by the democratic process. But those two were elected democratically, weren't they? They emerged in that process, but uh, I think that the policies were not democratically chosen. Objection. Yeah. The U.S. president is not chosen democratically. Thank you. Good clarification. Semi-democratically. 
sometimes <clears throat> in the past. <laughs> um, anyone else with uh, thoughts about our democratic fetish? <laughs> Comments? Uh, well, one of the uh, not one of the dimensions is is with time and stuff. So authoritarians, it's much easier for them. The propaganda about how great the good old days were. Um, the challenge progressives have is convincing people that tomorrow can be better than today and stuff. So I don't know how that ties in, but I just wanted to. Thanks, um, Gil, if you, Gil, if you want to put your hand down, uh, our cue now is Stacy Ken Gill. <clears throat> Scott, go. He's off camera. Scott, wow. <laughs> That's all I'll say to that. Um, so I've been trying to think of a phrase that's equivalent to the do your research. And for me, that's look at the patterns. And there's more than one reason for that. Like I think what typically would come to mind, like in this group is obvious, look at the patterns we learn, you know, through history. But there's another reason which ties into, you know, this theme that, you know, I've been spending a lot of time with meta related projects and we talk about bringing the unseen into the scene. And sort of to where Wendy put in the comments, when you can see the patterns, it also helps you to see where you can jump in, where there's a place where those patterns match your passions and you can jump in and meet to try and shift them. So I just wanted to put that out there because I wasn't prepared to share anymore, so. If you have time later, I will read that poem that I shared with Jerry, Wendy, it's the poem that we had yesterday. Actually, I will share, I will take that time to share the poem. Why don't you do that, please? And uh, did you did you find a text version of it? Um, no, but I found a way to work around it. Okay, okay good. <clears throat> it feels so good to realize that the energy that creates worlds is supporting you, to wake up every morning in clarity, knowing exactly who you are, to know that source is thinking through you, to experience meaningful rendezvous, to dovetail with the right people who give you the right piece of information just at the right time, to never feel dependent upon anyone, to feel the energy that creates worlds moving through your fingertips and through your mind, to see evidence all around, you of the thoughts you have been thinking and to feel the power of who you are. That's what you came for. And I think that I can't find you now. I can't we're here, you. we're here. I can't see you. <laughs> well, I can't see you, but I'll figure that out. But um, that's what being able to see the patterns also helps to do. And I can't find you. <laughs> Just uh, alt tab until you I find the you. zoom. <clears throat> good, good, good. <laughs> um, thanks, Stacy. Really appreciate that. Um, let's go, Ken Gill. Good morning, afternoon, evening, where you might be. I think everybody's in the US here. Um, so, probably morning or afternoon. Let's see. Um, there's a thread running through this that that is related to what I'm currently doing. I, I have my work is very slow at the moment. Um, I have a couple of projects in the pipeline that haven't uh, come through yet, so I'm, I have a little slack period. And I'm reading Damon Santola's book, uh, Change, How to Make Big Things Happen, which I can't recommend highly enough. Just really amazing book. And um, I'm reading it on Kindle, so I highlight a lot of stuff. And then after I do three or four chapters, I stop, I go back, and I type up my highlights so that I really remember uh, the high points of the book. And I, I run about one page of notes for every 10 to 12 pages of, of the book. So um, I'm getting a nice, you know, distilled version. Um, and I'm really intrigued with, uh, for those who don't aren't familiar with him, he talks about... Um, uh, social change. So um, the civil rights movement, the fall of the Berlin Wall, Arab Spring, um, the rise of Twitter, they all were really complex phenomena. It wasn't, <clears throat> excuse me, it wasn't until um, 
Arab Spring that we and, and the rise of Twitter that you really had the tools to analyze things um, scientifically and really track this. So he makes a distinction between simple contagions, which spread virally, just like uh, disease, which has been our model for how things grow and change for over about a century now. But complex contagions are um, changes in behavior. They entail a risk to reputation or psychological risk or um, uh, financial risk. And those don't spread virally. They spread through um, the power of weak ties across networks. And um, it's just, I'm, I'm only in chapter four, so I, I don't have um, you know the, the full picture here, but it's a really intriguing story of the difference between simple and context, complex contagions and how they spread through networks. And the real power of to change networks does not lie with the social superstars, not the Oprahs of the world. It's the network periphery, where if you can get things frothing at the periphery, where people start to connect on a personal level, then there's a huge potential for change. And I think this has some really interesting implications for what we're about here at OGM. So. I'll report back uh, at a later date when I've absorbed more of the book and have uh, more practical and pragmatic uh, ways to apply what I'm learning. Um, thanks, Ken. I love that. And Centola keeps coming up, and I have I started the book but didn't didn't sort of get very far into it. It's one of those that I like should power through somehow. Um, it and picks I'm, up after like hmm. chapter three. He starts talking, telling some really great stories about Google Glass and why it failed. And um, uh, you know, Google made some really huge missteps. You know, between Glass and Google Plus, um, and they they really not um, not done their homework on things, or they didn't understand how things were working. So once I found once he started telling the stories, it became harder to put the book down. The first introduction at first chapter like eh, you know but once you get into once he gets into this the the tales of how it applies it gets really interesting thanks ken uh wendy yeah so just a clarifying question if i if i followed you right ken because i was also reading stuff in chat so i apologize could i sum it up by saying you're getting from the book that to create change requires connection or is it it's oversimplification maybe but that's the so, basic the best way I can best way I can sum it up is he, he says, you know, many of us look for the special people in the networks to create change. Like if we can just get an Oprah or, a, you know, a big name, then people will you know take this on. He says, but actually, we want to look for the special places in the network, that there are certain areas in the network where things where change gets really interesting. Um, and it goes against our traditional view of, you know, we think things spread through a viral method, but they don't. Uh, social change that require the complex contagions requires um, building stuff up. So let me give you a brief example. In Korea, uh, in the 50s, they realized that they were going to have a huge problem with overpopulation. And so they had to um, uh, come up with a national plan for contraception. But the Korean culture was one where they valued children. And contraception was just anathema. People are like, you can't take my ability to, to procreate away from me. That's part of part and parcel of who we are. And they found out that the towns that were really successful, um, it, it proved to be successful over time. And there was no one method of contraception because they offered birth control pills, IUDs, condoms, you know. And what would happen is there'd be a group of people, especially the women in the villages who would say, we're gonna talk about this. And okay, here's what we're gonna choose. And then they might have a connection with another village somewhere else. And they go, oh, if you're doing that, then we should talk about this here. So it was actually the weak ties between the villages, not that there was one you know, really well-known group that said, here's what we're gonna do. And it took that. And so while Korea was successful in adopting a, a mass plan for contraception, there was no one method. Lots of people chose IUDs, lots of people chose birth control pills, lots of people chose condoms. And it had to do with what did your connection to the other villages, um, what did they choose? And it was just simply legitimizing the conversation, not the content, not the, the method, but rather it's an important thing. We need to talk about this and it is necessary for us going forward or we're gonna be in really big trouble. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And if I could just respond, I, I, to me, what I hear in that is it's about the connections between yes. people, right? It's about the relationship I have with people. So I'm going to go back to that. And a good, another good example of that is when the vaccines were being rolled out, 
Um, there were some success stories I heard about in other countries where there was resistance to the vaccines and then in entire groups. And so they sat down with the leaders of those groups, not to be like this big leader who would make change, but understanding that that leader then had connection with an entire, an entire group of people to help the leader understand and then still providing the choice for those people, but just giving them the information, letting them ask all the questions they wanted to ask mm -hmm. so that they felt like they were in a trusted, supported environment answering their specific concerns. And again, it's not about the information or the passing of information. It was about the people sitting down together and listening to each other, right? And listening to their concerns and, and, and and them having access to the experts to get answers. To me, that speaks so much more about the connection between people. Same thing repeats in classrooms, right? Kids don't learn if they're at nearly as well, not even close to as well, mm -hmm. if, the te if they don't feel a connection to the teacher mm -hmm. or to the yep. material. I would put that a little bit on the side too, right? Yep. Sometimes the connection to the material can be enough to surpass the connection to the teacher. So it's, they've done so many research studies, right? It's, it's the connection that, that, that enables the transfer of information. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I can phrase this properly or not, because I've not absorbed the whole book, but in making the distinction, we have networks of strong ties, which is our, you know, most of us here have a strong tie to each other. We talk regularly, right? Um, and strong tie is the strong tie social networks have redundancy. And so, um, you know, if Klaus's idea about the farm bill is going to ricochet around here because we're all totally there. Yeah, let's support Klaus and the Farm Bill. They're, we're not reaching new people. So your network connection is a little bit wasted when you start trying to talk to somebody in OGM about Klaus's Farm Bill because they're like, oh, yeah, you're preaching the choir. It's when you, Wendy, have a connection to another network and you take Klaus's idea and say, I'm going to share this with my other network that you form a bridge to the network periphery and you get things moving in a different network. So it is very much about people connecting strongly uh, to an idea or a concept, but it's also being able to take move from the strong tie network to a weak tie network of, I'm gonna take this over here to this other network I'm part of and start talking. And then they're gonna pick this up because they trust me. So it's actually the weak ties that that create the spread. Weak ties give you reach. Strong ties give you redundancy. Redundancy creates resistance. Um, so that's it's it's a lot of technical stuff, and I apologize for not being clearer. So I hope that helps. I think it does a lot. Uh, Wendy, did you want to jump back in? Cool. Uh, Hank, then Stuart, then Doug. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks really a lot, uh, Ken. Uh, for me, uh, crystal clear, uh, weak ties and strong ties are often uh, confused and thrown into the same box and that there is actually research and intelligent uh, writing about it that's uh, an accessible writing to, uh, about it. I think that that's really important for us all to understand. Uh, so I, I, I think this is one of the themes that really needs to be explored more in this group and other OGM groups and in other groups in our own networks, because uh, there are, uh, I mistyped something earlier that I think it was Doug said, and he said every society is led by a powerful individual and I was writing it out and I wrote every society is led by eight powerful individuals, sort of uh, oligarchy or, or whatever the technical name for that is. And that's probably very close to the way I see the world. Uh, but which eight people is it? And, and how do you reach them? And, and how do you get people to understand that? And one bridge comment to something I also put in the, in the uh, chat while thanking Stacy, I think poetry and the poetic imagination uh, has a lot more power over people than we tend to think because poetry seems to a lot of people to be very elitist and you know it's it's for them and, and not for us but in in my experience working with just normal people uh, uh, I'll go back to my example of the Reichswaterstaat and the water management people, the, the, the workers who stand with the knee-high boots shoveling shit out of the ditches along the highway, 
poetry is also really important for people like that and they've demonstrated it to me enough times so thanks again stacy and and anyone bringing poetry i know jerry's done it in the mm. past as well anyone bringing poetry into these conversations uh, speaking of poetry <laughs> Yeah, what's 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 really interesting uh, is that I have a poem out for a presentation that I that I did this morning at eight o'clock to another group, which is just absolutely perfect. So I smile, Hank, when you mentioned you know poetic, but I raised so I'm happy to do that at the at the uh, at the end of the session. Um, but I wanted to punctuate something that that Ken said. Um, and a, and a coral it is, uh, and I'm I'm I'm, and I'm, the coral it is that um, a lot of people working in a narrow area um, think that they have the answer, <laughs> okay, and we're living in a world of many many complex challenges, and to have that awareness that. Um, that they have a piece of the of the answer, okay? They have the answer to a specific challenge, but there are many other areas that that need addressing, and that's why the collaboration or a network of networks becomes such an important phenomenon. That people can see where others have pieces to the you know to the to the larger solution, um, and then you can start networking those folks. Because there's always a, you know, um, to use Bohm's work, the perturbation. If you, if you, you know, poke a system, there's a, a, a an unintended consequence of some kind. And how do we, how do we resolve all of those different vectors that go into creating a, a larger solution? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stuart. Um, and happy to hear the poem at the end. Uh, Doug, then Klaus. So when people talk about improving and making more effective systems, uh, often we forget that it's in the context of other people making other systems and connections. Uh, Manuel Castells at Berkeley, uh, a sociologist who's written a lot about networks, wrote a book called Rupture, where he says that the multiple connections among everybody with everybody is tearing apart institutions and making society ungovernable. Uh, we got to take that seriously. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Klaus? Yeah, pretty much in the same vein, what uh, uh, Doug was just saying, but has been mentioned here. Um, a network of networks requires a translation or adaptation of the information to a different context. And to get back to my previous example, I mean, the Sierra Club has chapters in every single state, and then some more uh, uh, chapters in within states. New York has several, and so on. So, if we can get water as a dominant theme, then the person living in Florida will translate this differently than the person living in California, right? So, so you go to your California networks and you translate this conversation in different ways than you would you know, in, in other states because you're dealing with trout versus pollution and, or, or excessive water and so on in the Mississippi River Delta. So, so th that, that is the power of network of networks. Now, if we, if we can, and, and this, is, this is the hierarchy of information that is required. And Sherry, you were putting something out uh, a new idea that of something you want to work on, um, which I interpreted as a hierarchy of information you know, along the Donella Meadows leverage points of a system where if you have a narrative that, that is a, a meta level narrative, um, that then needs to roll through the system in ways that it can be operationalized. You know, and this operationalization looks different depending on local circumstances. So the adaptation uh, required on a on a meta level narrative down throughout the system is where typically things fail. You know, the, we, there are great ideas at meta level, but the operationalization is doesn't have structure, isn't organized, and 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 fails because one idea doesn't cut it. Right? It needs to it needs to uh, be be interpreted. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, we're not going to make it through our queue today because we're getting close to the end of our call, but let's go Gil, Doug Breitbart, and Carl. So much here. Um, let's see. Um, Ken, I, I love the notion of frothing the periphery. I've got my I've got my frother. I'm ready to go. So love to hear more about how we do that. Um, I wonder how how the weak ties uh, business goes when the corpus callosum between the red and the blue hemispheres has been severed, uh, as it has in this country. So that's just a, a thing to use about as you dive in deeper. Uh, also, to Ken, you mentioned uh, Google's failures. Um, uh, um, uh, maybe those, you know, maybe those aren't not having thought things through well enough. Maybe those are experiments that failed in a company that's willing to experiment and has resources to throw at big experiments. I don't know if that's such a bad thing. Um, picking up on some stuff earlier in the conversation about the despair of the young, it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. I have some uh, younger relatives and I'm just really struck by, uh, you know, when I was their age, when I was in my teens and 20s, the world, it felt like the world was wide open. It felt like opportunities were vast. There were, you know, it was a mood of reinvention and creation and change. Uh, and they're in a mood of constraint and closing doors and lockdown. And I just, you know, trying to imagine how that feels uh, inside their beings. Um, and so I think the conversation we'd be having about pattern and perspective are really important because, um, uh, how to say this? If all folks today are, are seeing as what's in front of them, it's pretty scary shit. Um, and if they see the historical sweep of the rises and falls of the human experience, maybe the perspective opens a little bit. You know, what was the mood uh, among Blacks in the South in the early 1950s before the civil rights movement started cranking? What was the sense of impossibility and resignation and stuckness? And something opened up over the course of 10 or 15 years of organizing. And um, you know, finding ways maybe to elders to share that experience with younger people about what that felt like and what kind of action was involved in shifting that sense of possibility and that sense of mood may be a place for us to think about, um, to think about. Um, um, so, you know, I, I think a lot, I, I woke up, um, the morning of, I guess this was last week, the um, when the when the Supremes offered up their EPA decision, you know, capping a week of, from from my perspective, horrific uh, retrograde uh, decisions, basically trying to wipe out the last fifty years of social progress, and they ain't done yet, kids. Uh, I was really surprised that my mood was not despair; my mood was serenity and resoluteness. Of like, uh, I, I will. I'll, I'll try to post in the chat a uh, a piece from Chris Hedges about um, you know about how, how to face the challenges of this moment. Um, so um, so I think a lot about how we look at events and how we absorb them and how that affects our mood and how we stand and move in the face of all this stuff. And that's part of the story, I think, of the everything we've been talking about today, from weak networks to authoritarian pathways uh, and poetry and the rest. Um, um, just as part of the uh, or as part of the personal check-in here, I've been focusing, as you guys know, on standing up a holding company um, to um, um, to work with small and medium-sized businesses to become ecologically grounded and employee-owned and community-rooted companies. Uh, momentum is building on that. We've made some really powerful, I think, interesting connections this week. Um, um, and my request to you all is if you know anybody who has been in the private equity business and who knows that game and wants to do something better um, with their ex skills and experience and passion and just make another pile of money, I want to talk to them. So I'm looking for introductions to people who are private equity players with, with chops and heart. Um, and um, so that's when we're, my main focus is, my secondary focus is around coaching, working with leaders and emerging leaders, young or old, whatever. Uh, one of my clients told me last week that the work together has been the best invest, business investment he's ever made. And it's an interesting thing coming from a serial entrepreneur. So if I can be of assistance to anybody you know, um, I request an introduction there. And um, 
zooming back out to the background, I'm find myself putting a lot of attention on how I listen and how we listen um, and how our interpretations shape how we're able to listen and what's the what's where's the fluidity and the dynamics and possibility in that and I'll leave it at that for now because I know time is short but uh, I also just want to say I enormously value these conversations uh, I keep on thinking about how to streamline my commitments every week to be able to focus more on what I need to do and I look at this and there's no way that I can cut this out. I love being with you all. It's just a real rich um, feeding of my spirit. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and it, it, uh, one of your comments in the middle, it saddens me that people don't know more history or care about history. And every now and then when I want to get really depressed, I'll go watch Jay Leno's interviews of people on the street where he asks them really simple, stupid questions and nobody knows the answer. But then you ask them like, what the names of Kim Kardashian's kids are. And it's like, got that. Yeah. So people aren't stupid. We've somehow like managed to dumb ourselves down as a, as a culture, as a civilization, as a society or something like that. But it's, it's just very disheartening. Well, we, you know, we, we, we've stopped teaching history. Right. Well, we turned it into social studies and which and, turned into mush, which got know, political. And, yeah. Well, also, and when we've taught history, we teach like facts and dates, but that's right. not what it is. It's stories. Yeah, yeah. And they're all interpretations and they all reveal something about how we look at the world. And so, yeah, I mean, the United States is a very strange place compared to other countries. Very strange. Very true. Yeah. Uh, Stuart. I just wanted to uh, uh, comment, Gil, I so appreciate you bringing up the civil rights movement of the 50s and, and, and um, the perseverance that Black people um, have had in this country. I, I, you know, uh, diversity is good, but it's also essential. I mean, you know, in terms of our mood here, imagine if we had some older Black people who were there in that period of time and understand is to persevere. I think there's a lot of wisdom and a yeah. lot of learning and a lot of cross-pollinization that could go on from that context. So thank you, Gil. Yeah, and this is one of the challenges and weaknesses of this group, frankly, is that we don't have that diversity with us. There was a piece in the Washington Post this morning, I posted it into the, into the um, listserv, um, observing that this weekend in Chicago, um, there was more people killed than in Highland Park this weekend, uh, but there was no massive police presence and there was no media coverage and there was no flying in of crisis counselors to help people deal with the trauma. There were kids who had a guy murdered like right outside their schoolyard, nobody there to help them. And it's talking with the parents who say, well, yeah, this is, you know, we're in a different world, different universe, um, you know, we don't here it's taken for granted and the support doesn't come and when it happens in a white community all of a sudden it's oh my god and maybe there's some value in the oh my god but there's you know there's a window into the different worlds that we live in um and the different experiences that need that we you know we <laughs> we're not exposed to that world except in little bits of news occasionally that maybe comes across our, our desks. And uh, that's where a lot of folks live. How do we bridge that? How do we, what are, what are, what are, the, weak, can, what are the weak ties, Ken, um, that move across those kind of gulfs? I don't, I don't know if Centola talks about that. It'd be really interesting to hear more. I'll stop. Um... Stuart, we're kind of at the end of our time. I think we're not going to make it through the rest of our queue. And I was thinking of inviting you to read the poem you mentioned uh, that you had read earlier in the day, and that would take us out of the call today. Uh, my pleasure. So it's called Gratitude, all right? Gratitude. And, um, and the reflective question is, can you be more deliberate generating the joy, healing, and discovery connections bring? Can you increase the presence of sacred relating? <clears throat> gratitude. Thankful, I don't ask for more. People, presence, opening doors. Exciting elations relationship brings, provides learning so many things. Privilege, pleasure, engaging deep, connections make a faint heart leap. Communion of gathering beings enables flight. They are wings. Grateful for all who hear, listening to a voice sincere. We can give more than we know, 
In openness, we serve and grow. Grateful boundaries disappear as you listen and truly hear. What passes between more than gold, alchemy of presence slows getting old. Thanks to source, four dear friends, without connections at loose ends. Joy pervades when souls touch. For this treasure, thank you so much. Thanks, Stuart. That's a very lovely way. Wendy, this you could pin this on the wall, maybe. <laughs> so much, so much here about connections and resonance and, and all. Um, thank you. Thanks all for a great call. And uh, see you on the inner tubes. Ciao. Thank you. Be well, folks. Bye bye.